look like. He is the executive editor of Emergence Magazine, an online publication exploring the connections between ecology, culture, and spirituality. Prior to his work in film, Emmanuel performed with some of the biggest names in jazz, as well as releasing two critically acclaimed records, Previous Misconceptions and Borrowed Time. So welcome, Emmanuel. Uh, Andrea Mito yeah. uh, is a geologist in the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Unit uh, within the Astro Materials Research oh. Exploration and Science Division at the Johnson Space Center. She works with astronaut photography from the International Space Station. Mito creates time-lapse videos, writes articles for NASA's Earth Observatory, is on the ARIES social media team, and is also involved with GIS tasks within the group. Additionally, Mito has geologic research experience with structural geology, geology, igneous petrology, and rock magnetism of terrestrial peridotites, and completed her master's thesis on Martian sugar tight, Northwest Africa, 6963. Uh, welcome, Andrea. Uh, Dr. William Stefanoff is the International Space Station Program Scientist for Earth Observations. He is the principal investigator for the ISS Crew Earth Observations Facility, training and working with astronauts to collect handheld digital camera imagery of the Earth. He supports the NASA Science Mission Directorate and Earth Science Disasters Program as an expert in Earth remote sensing science and data. Dr. Stefanov is an internationally recognized researcher in geological and ecological remote sensing. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, uh, Erica Blumenfeld, who will be our, our uh, moderator for this panel. Erica is a transdisciplinary artist who works at the intersection of art, science, nature, and culture. Her research-based non-traditional art practice is motivated by the wonder of natural phenomena, and she often works in collaboration with scientists and research institutions, including NASA, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, McDonald Observatory, and the South African National Antarctic Program. Blumenfeld is both a Guggenheim Fellow and a Smithsonian Fellow, and has exhibited in museums and galleries nationally and internationally, and has artwork in many permanent collections, including the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. She is also currently the science principal investigator on a project at NASA Johnson Space Center, where she is leading a team to create a 3D virtual astro materials sample collection to bring research-grade virtual models of the Apollo lunar and Antarctic meteorite samples to researchers and the public. Welcome, Erica. <laughs> turn it over to her. Um, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, there yes, we there we are. Okay, great. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for, for that lovely introduction, and thank you to the LPI for inviting us here to celebrate um, the incredible Earthrise photograph and this 50-year um, anniversary. This is really quite an honor, and we're really happy to be here, so thanks so much for coming. And um, thank you, Emmanuel, for your beautiful film. I've now seen this film five times, <laughs> and I still get really teary every time. That first image comes up of Earthrise after he's taken the film. And there's just such an emotional quality. So what strikes me is that beyond all the incredible feats of creativity and science and engineering and human ingenuity that we had to overcome in order to actually even travel to the moon, that what remains perhaps the most significant consequence of the Earthrise photograph is that it conveys what it means to live on a world. And so I've always felt that the Earthrise photograph is humanity's first self-portrait, that a few members of our species were circling the moon, looking back at Earth, and there was a sense of reciprocality because there are all these, the rest of humanity is on Earth looking up at the moon in wonder that a few of us were up there and they were looking back at the Earth 
suspended in space and with the same sense of wonder. And so as tumultuous as a time as 1968 was, I feel like this image captured a self-portrait of us in wonder, which I think is such a beautiful idea. In fact, it's, it's a profound poetry of humanity looking at itself, really. And that even today, when we look at the photograph, um, we still, in a sense, see ourselves. So Earthrise wasn't really a, just about taking a picture. It wasn't just about taking a photograph. It was really about conveying an experience. And what I love about your film, Emmanuel, is that it's also trying to convey that experience. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the motivations behind your pursuing this, this film about Earthrise and then also about your work more generally. Thank you, Erica, and thank you all for coming out this evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and share the film. Um, so, as you said, you know, the photograph captures an experience, um, and that's something I always felt when I saw that photograph. And actually, when I see so much of the photography that was captured of the Earth through the Apollo missions, I feel an experience. I don't feel like I'm just looking at a photograph. I feel like I'm transported somewhere. And I think part of the reason is those photographs were taken by people who were experiencing something and capturing that through you know, through a physical celluloid based experience. And um, it, it has a physicality to it. And I always felt that when I looked at the Earthrise image and the other images that were captured, whether by Bill Anders or the other photographers from the Apollo program. Um, and as you said, this, is, this was taken a, in a very tumultuous time in 1968. Uh, and it captured people's imaginations. It shifted their perspective. You might even say it changed a collective consciousness here on Earth of seeing ourselves as separate, you know, countries, people, to, uh, you know, a holistic whole understanding of, oh, we're all actually living on one planet, and this image captures that. Uh, and I was really thinking about how, you know, here we are almost 50 years later, and these images that have become so ubiquitous, like the text card that said at the end of the film, these are some of the most reproduced images in history. Um, they've become so ubiquitous, we see them everywhere, uh, you know, they have then influenced the way that we present Earth, whether it's in action movies or video games or posters or T-shirts or lunch boxes, whatever it might be. And yet, are we really connected and uh, fully understanding the power and meaning of what that image offered back then at this time when we're in, dealing with so much conflict and division and in some ways worse than 1968 because it's just gotten global in a way that it wasn't then. You know, it's a very different Earth. If they took a picture of the Earth now from the moon, it was the first time it'd be a very different Earth than what happened then. And so I thought, well, could we go back to that moment and tell that story um, with the hope of reconnecting to that experience that was captured in that image from the first human beings to see that image, to, to have that experience? Um, could we go on a journey back with them what was their experience like? And can it be opportunity to reflect on what does it mean to build a relationship with a sense of home in the biggest sense that we can as human beings on this planet? Um, I, I would like to bring Andrea and Will into the conversation and, and to ask you to also to reflect on your work, but in terms of how your work focuses on the Earth. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming out. Um, now, when this image was taken in 1968, uh, I don't want to look at it, but I was actually alive at the time. Um, but I was only three years old, so I was not really that into the Apollo program uh, as was going on. But So the first time I actually saw this image was roughly 20 years after, well, 20 years, uh, 20 years after it was taken. Um, and in many ways, this image uh, ties into my own career uh, doing what I am now as a remote sensing uh, scientist, a, a geologist looking at the Earth primarily through a number of the instruments that were developed following this kind of photography. Uh, right after the Apollo program ended, we began the Skylab program. And part of the Skylab program was testing whether we could take imagery of the Earth in wavelengths uh, that we can't see with our own eyes. 
wavelengths in the near infrared, the short wave infrared. And these are wavelengths that give us much more information, different information about minerals, rocks, plants on the surface uh, than we can gather with our own eyes. And from that came the Landsat series of, of uh, satellites, which has been collecting imagery of the Earth now since 1972. It has been one of the prime sources of information that we have that we now understand a lot of processes that operate on the Earth that you, just can't, you couldn't really uh, appreciate from being a geologist on the ground. Um, and so, in a way, this is kind of the grandfather image, if you will, to uh, a lot of the, the very science of remote sensing that tells us a lot about what's going on on the Earth right now. And as Emmanuel mentioned, that amount of information has grown exponentially over the years to the point where you know, we live in a world now where I can pick up a smartphone and I can look at the surface of the sun, which is pretty damn amazing, I think. Uh, but also, uh, we have all this information now that within hours, we can see an erupting volcano on the other side of the Earth. We can see, uh, you know, during the Kuwait War, we can see oil fields burning due to human activities. Uh, we're now much more interconnected and aware of everything going on on our planet than we were uh, at the time that this image was taken. But this was the beginning of that knowledge. Okay. Oh. There's always one mic. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I'll hold, if I hold it here? Okay, that might work. So, yeah. <laughs> no? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank y'all. Thank everyone for coming. So, um, I definitely wasn't alive when this picture was taken. <laughs> Um, but at the end, I'd love to hear some of y'all's perspectives that were. Um, where is it going to start? <laughs> oh, goodness, I'm losing my train of thought. Yes, so at JSC, I work primarily with astronaut photography taken from the space station, and we do look at shuttle uh, imagery as well from the early 2000s. And just working with this imagery, knowing that a human has taken this picture, it, it does put like a personal touch to each photo because that every picture is taken with a purpose. And so you, it might be a blurry photo or it might seem like a plain photo sometimes, because which shouldn't be the case. I mean, <laughs> it's photos of the Earth taken by astronauts, but um, it gives, um, it's good to have a sense of perspective that someone has taken that photo and I can understand that feeling and I get to work and look at it every day. Uh, one of my favorite things is looking at how the surface has changed um, in just a short amount of time. So we have photography over the past 50 years of Earth and seeing um, like deforestation in South America expanding from astronaut photography or like Will said, certain fires occurring. Um, it's powerful to see these images and know that um, people behind it are thinking about us on Earth. Um, one of the reasons why I love that we're celebrating the Earthrise photograph is because we're really celebrating also the persistence of a dream. And that for the last 2,500 years, we've held this curious longing to see the earth from above. And so across art and literature and philosophy and eventually science and technology, we have been holding this dream of imagining what it would look like to experience our earth um, from space. So I've listed a few here of the earliest versions of what various people thought the earth might look like from space, including Kepler's science fiction novel, but my research, in, in my research, one of the things that I found most astounding was that we can actually thread all the way back. Um, the first documented vision was in the fourth century BC. And it was Plato's recounting of Socrates' description. And I'm going to read you a few sent sentences from that. The true earth, if one views it from above, is said to look like a patchwork of color, like those the painters use. The whole earth is of, co of such colors, indeed, of colors far brighter and purer than we know. One portion is purple, 
marvelous for its beauty, another is golden, and all that is white is whiter than chalk or snow. Even in the very hollows, full, of, full of they are, as they are of water and air, give us the appearance of color, gleaming among the varieties of other colors, so that its general appearance is one of continuous, multicolored surface. And I just love that that presupposes so many of the photos that we see today, although we were talking about the idea of purple earlier, and somebody shared that actually there, um, there was an experience of purple. <laughs> anyway, um, getting ahead of myself. But um, so jumping ahead here, way ahead, um, we have a long history now of, of imaging the Earth. So I thought we should talk about the significance. I mean, from Plato to Kepler to now high altitude air balloons in 1935, all the way across to Apollo 8. What does it mean to be a human being looking at your own planet? And what are the stories that looking at the Earth can tell us? Well, one of the things that I think the this ability that we've developed to look at our, our planet on a now sort of hourly basis uh, with some of the sensors that we have up now, as, a, as I kind of alluded to a little earlier, it, it in some ways it uh, the volume of information that we now have about what's going on on our own planet, I think, has really influenced our thinking about our own actions on that planet. Uh, and one way of looking at it is. Uh, we don't really have any excuse not to know what's going on around the planet anymore. Uh, we can see from any, from all professors, from the, excuse me, from the North Pole to the South Pole uh, and everywhere in between, uh, on a daily basis, we can see wildfires happening. We can see deforestation occurring and reforestation occurring. Uh, we can see with different sensors, we can see increasing temperatures. We can see glaciers changing uh, in shape and volume. And so we, it tells us something is going on, and we're now developing the ability to really understand what that something is and what's causing it. Uh, so I think in that sense, it, it, uh, it removes perhaps some of our naivete, I guess, as a species. And so we, we, uh, you know, it's, the bur it's the burden of information um, that we, we can't ignore anymore. We, we, we see this going on, and we have to figure out what to do about it if we wish to preserve the kind of life that we've come to accustom we've become accustomed to. I, I think that any image, you know, that's really powerful from from, you know, does not necessarily even from space, um, has a, a, the ability to create a context of understanding where you are and who you are. You know, I think whether it's a photograph or whether it's a painting, you know, when we look at great art, great photography, it tells a story that helps us understand who we are and where you are. Maybe you see your reflection of yourself in the Mona Lisa. You see a reflection of yourself in a Van Gogh. Maybe not directly, but there's something in there that, that provides a context for understanding who you are, part of your humanity. And I think for for me, what's so striking about the Earthrise and the subsequent images all the way up to what's happening now and the work that you're a part of is it continues to tell a story to place ourselves in a world that we can understand. And prior to the Earthrise photograph, there were no images that provide a context to place us and give us a context for who we are and how we are as a planetary species. So that's why that photograph was so powerful, because it provided a context for us to place ourselves within a story. And we're, human, we're a species that loves stories. We love images. We need a context to place ourselves. As valuable as data is to scientists, as we were talking earlier, there needs to be a story in which to convey that data and understanding so that we can relate to it, especially a broader public. And so this photo did that. It was like a realization of this is who we are and where we are at a cusp in our history when we were really going from a more you know, individual nation state based culture to a globalized culture and realizing what that means. And here's an image which provides a context for that. This, the sad thing for me is here we are all these years later and do we really recognize what that means to us? That, that, that what, what the photograph offers are these continued photographs that, that show the unfolding devastation that's occurring in the rainforest or uh, the loss of solar ice caps. They're part of our story. They're part of our home. They're part of the context and the story that we live in. 
So to me, they have to continue to provide that context, but we need to continue to relate to what that context offers us. I think that um, just looking at the earth from above, from a human's perspective, it I agree, it gives you more of a global awareness. Um, kind of boundaries disappear because you, don't, you really only see landforms. You see clouds covering the, um, clouds going across entire oceans. Um, you see mountains that continue across entire continents. It's um, being a, more aware of our surroundings and knowing that it's a lot of these are interconnected systems, whether it's um, natural or changes we've made to our surface. Uh, it's profound to remember that. Particularly like um, the idea of Earthrise in a sense becoming almost, a, like you said, the, almost the first interplanetary perspective. And um, you can't hear me? Um, is there a way to turn the volume up on me a little bit, or no? Sure. To the right side. Is that better? Can you hear me better? Yeah? Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> um, great. Well, so, um, but I love this idea of it being interplanetary because, um, well, um, looking at where we've where we've gone from Apollo eight, um, you know, we've we've had many other vantage points um, to look at Earth, and and one of my most um, one of my favorite, and and one that I think is the most profound, um, is the the famous pale blue dot image that was requested by Carl Sagan um, in 1997 when. In, to be photographed by the Voyager 1 um, at 3.7 billion miles away. And what I love about this is that we, we keep seeking ourselves from deeper within the cosmos. And, and it does. It brings up that, that question of in, you know, interplanetary. Um, and yet these images continue to remind us of needing to be better stewards of our own planet. So, I mean, we've talked about this some, but... but you know, additionally, like how, how have these images of Earth and space motivated us, you know, culturally, scientifically, environmentally, where we keep, we keep kind of coming back to this point. But um, maybe let's look at that from the cosmic perspective. Um, we recently had a photograph from the Parker Solar Probe of, you know, of our planet, which is right here. And there's this continuum not just with um, across the images of the Earth, but if you look, um, I don't know if you can see it very well, it's kind of behind us, but, but um, I've listed some of the you know, consecutive environmental policies and acts and, and social events that have occurred kind of in tandem on this continuum to kind of discuss that. But maybe we could talk about that a little bit more. Um, So something that, that strikes me about these images, you know, and this whole this whole idea that we we're seeking ourselves further and further into the cosmos, is when you look at these, if we didn't know which one of these was the Earth, you know, we, it, you would have no idea whatsoever that we even existed. And I specifically, a lot of these images always come with an arrow that says you are here. Right, right, and exactly. I, Exactly. I specifically chose not to include those because I wanted you to feel that question of like, where is it? Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I felt like I oh. should. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I just think it, it, it's an interesting perspective uh, to show that because it, it does kind of get back to some of the things that the Apollo 8 astronauts, you know, the, the effect that seeing the Earth from their perspective had, which is reinforced by this sort of thing, that that even from the, the, the relatively small distance that they were away from the Earth, uh, you know, you couldn't see, you couldn't see boundaries. In fact, you wouldn't even know that there was any, it was an inhabited planet. Uh, I mean, if you did that nowadays, you, you might get a little bit more of an indication because I think there's probably a lot more lights, you know, nighttime lights around the planet. But, but still, 
the further away you go, the less the less and less obvious it becomes that there's anything, you know, anything that we would we would, well we would call ourselves intelligent uh, on on this on this ball, you know, in, in amongst all these other lights that you see in this area. Uh, and I think, you know, you take that perspective and then you kind of flip it around back to the near orbit perspective that we all have all become very familiar with, with you know Google Earth and cell phones and being able to see anywhere on our own planet at the touch of a button. Um, how to? It's a it's an interesting dichotomy that you you know because on the one hand you have no evidence of humans here, and on the other hand we have a plethora of evidence that we kind of are still figuring out what to do with. Um, okay. So, do you think the the farther away our vantage point our vantage point gets, the farther away our ability to connect with the Earth? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's recounting what I learned from my experience of sitting down with the Apollo 8 astronauts, what they repeated, and as the sentiment is expressed in the film, is that it's really home that was the realization they had, that their Earth was their home. I mean, so much so that. Uh, Frank Borman, the command or commander of this mission, gave up being the next commander for the next mission. He could have walked on the moon. He said, I don't want to because this experience made me realize what's really important to me. And home for him was literally, it was like his wife and his kids. And he's like, I don't want to risk my life again. I've been to space. I've had this experience. I don't want to walk on the moon. I want to connect to what matters to me, which is home. And it seems like I don't know. Maybe maybe we're some sometimes we're simple creatures at, at a core at our core. You know, as far as we travel away from space, we're we wanting to look back and find out where we are and place ourselves. It's like when we're you know kids. You know, home is that fundamental central point that marks us in relation to, to our own identity, and that's still the case if we're explorers. We want to place ourselves in the context of home, and so for me, you know. I think one of the reasons why the photograph in in '68 had such an impact on uh, you know the planet and uh, you know policy and creation of Earth Day and inspiring NASA to say okay we're actually going to invest money in photography leading to Landsat leading to the ability to document all these changes is because at its core it was like oh this is home oh right I get it now like Lovell said well we were on the Earth so we didn't we knew all about the Earth. We weren't interested in the Earth. So we step out just a little bit. We're like, oh, wow. Okay, that's home. I can do that. You know, it's like there's something simple about just reminding ourselves that the Earth is home. Can we continue to do that so that we can continue to actually enact some sort of change, whether it's political or environmental or social, so that we're actually taking care of home? You know, that's where I think we fall short as we make these big leaps and we say, okay, we're going to be stewards, we're going to create these policies, but then we have to continue to be stewards, not just shepherd in one change and then let's say, okay, let's move on to the next one. It's like when you have a home, you have to keep cleaning your house. <laughs> Otherwise, it gets dirty. And <laughs> we don't do that very well. We want to say, well, let's build an addition. You know, I'm going to build an addition and let's build another driveway to my house and let's build a garage and let's buy a second house. But maybe we should just take care of the house that we have rather than <laughs> keep expanding. That's why I find, you know, what Bill says at the end of the film, he's like, well, before we go to Mars, and I just spent all morning inside NASA having my mind blown by all the things that people were doing to get us to Mars, you know, the incredible technology is being invested. But to me, you know, I, I find what Bill says to be very poignant. Before we go to Mars, can we actually get our act together here? And, you know, in some ways that realization they had back in 68, which was like, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to beat the Russians, we're going to go out there, we're going to plant the flag, we're going to go to the next place and claim it. It was like, oh, they looked back and it was the earth, which was the most important thing they had to claim, not as their own individually, but from a collective experience. So sorry for the long-winded response. <laughs> so the original question was, the further out you get... <laughs> Still, would you still recognize Earth or call it home or along those lines? So, yeah, I think it's it's our most well-known reference point. So no matter how far out 
we humans get or instruments get, um, there's always this like longing to go back to your reference point, which for us is earth and that's home. That's what we know best. I don't refer to the sun, I refer to home. Well, so over time, Earth observation has grown into these two distinct forms, the remote sensing and the astronaut photography, and they each tell different stories. Um, and so images like this tell the story of a declining glacier over time and it, obviously a changing climate. And these observations in turn have changed our understanding of the Earth system. So I thought maybe Will and Andrea could talk to us a little bit more about Earth observation um, techniques and, and how they've contributed to telling the stories of our Earth over both the, the long-term perspective, because now we have an enormous amount of data, um, and also with, in terms of the sense of immediacy of, of, of like disaster events. I think pictures of glaciers are one of our best examples of how our surface is changing within our lifetimes. Um, I mean, these are taken a few decades apart, and there's visible visible change of that glacier receding. Um, other changes that I think are valuable from not just astronaut photography, but all Earth imagery is... Um, like cities at night and how suburbs have grown or maybe even small towns have disappeared. Um, just having more and more data, as you said, collected um, of our surface and how it's changing in our lifetime to make you know, smart decisions for the future and plan uh, for how we are going to continue to live on this earth. Yeah, and uh, one uh, point that you raised earlier, Andrea, I think is, is kind of important is that the both astronaut photography and other sort of robotic sensors, if you want to call them that, one thing that they've shown us uh, when we bring in all the other science that goes along with the imagery is exactly how interconnected everything is. Uh, very, very little on the, or when you look at the Earth as a global system, very little takes place completely in a vacuum uh, from other systems. And I think that's a, that's a very important realization that we've come to, is just how interconnected all these different systems are. Uh, particularly for, for glaciers, uh, you might have uh, increasing climate in the northern hemisphere that at some later period in time actually affects the glaciers in the southern hemisphere. And these are things that we've learned partly because of the remotely sensed data that we've been able to collect over many years, where we can track these changes both in temperature and ice volume. Um, other things, so, so from that long time scale, that's enabled us to get a better idea of the, uh, the rhythm of the planet, if you want to think of it that way, and how these processes operate on long time scales. On a more sort of human time scale, with the systems that we have in place now, where we can collect data on an hourly basis, uh, or collect data, say, from the International Space Station, an astronaut takes a picture of a wildfire going on, and then four hours later that can be on the ground where it can then be processed or from other sensors it can be in four hours and given to the people uh, on the ground who are using it not just for science but for an actual application uh, things like disaster response this has become a big focus of the international space station and the use of astronaut photography and uh, this also is a new capability that remote sensing has enabled us to, to put into effect now um, 20 years ago you, you might get an indication that something was happening, a wildfire was burning, but you would take time to characterize that. People on the ground putting their lives at risk, seeing where those fire lines are and seeing how fast the fire is moving and where they're going to put fire breaks. Uh, we can now do that in large part from orbit, get that information down to first responders on the ground in a matter of hours so they can revise their approaches to dealing with that fire. And this has been very well de demonstrated just a few a month or so ago with the California, the, the Camp Fire and Woolsey fires, where the NASA Disasters Program, using all of the assets that we have run from different NASA centers working in concert, we were able to track those fires, uh, their, their temperatures and their fire lines and where they're moving, and get that information on a very routine basis to the California responding agencies. And so that actually helped them contain those fires. 
but it doesn't just stop on the event itself. Those fires are now contained, and you could consider them to be out, but we're now watching the same areas with a variety of remotely sensed instruments uh, to follow potential landslides occurring from those hill slopes that are now denoted, denuded of vegetation from heavy rain events that will mobilize all that sediment now and cause other potential problems. So I guess all this is to say that, that you know, the, the descendants of the Earthrise photo have now given us this, this uh, informative power, if you want to think of it, over, the, over, over our surroundings, this context that, uh, that Emmanuel mentioned, uh, to the, you know, it's, a, it's a powerful new tool that we have uh, that in, in many ways we are using for the betterment of, of humans. Um, and there's other things we still need to work on <laughs> to, to better use that data for other purposes. Well, and in terms of um, you know, the fires and, and you're continuing to um, look at the sensing data that, and the astronaut photography that comes through there, you would probably also continue to track like burn recovery. And so, for example, like this image of the Yellowstone recovery over, over time after the wildfire there, um, there are applications for remote sensing where we don't just see the decline, but we can see the regeneration and the conservation efforts. Would you, would you talk a little bit more about the kinds of regenerative um, and, and conservation efforts that you see? Yeah, so this, this image, uh, you know, we've been talking about astronaut photography a lot, and that's, that's uh, what we would call true color imagery. It's red, green, and blue. It's the same colors that your eye is sensitive to. So when you look at an astronaut photograph, in, uh, it's, it's very intuitively uh, very understandable to you. you. You essentially see the same thing that you would see looking out of an airplane. You have the same colors are what you would expect to see. This image, or this set of images, uh, was actually from, uh, from Landsat. And uh, this is an example of some of the sensor technology that I mentioned earlier, where because we're clever creatures, you know, we figured out ways to access the wavelength information in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum so that we can highlight areas that have been recently burned in this particular, in this, in this, in this sequence red. Uh, and then you can track it through time where you can see those burned areas are becoming revegetated in green. Uh, this is, and the reason these images look a bit strange is because this is what we would call a false color image, where we're, we're mapping different wavelengths informations into red, green, and blue, because those are, the, those are really the only colors that our eyes are sensitive to. Um, but being able to track this kind of recovery, this is important. Uh, we mentioned nighttime, uh, nighttime city lights. We're also using that kind of information to see both, uh, say, when a storm goes through, when Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Florence went through and Hurricane Michael, um, by taking before and after nighttime images, you can very easily pinpoint where power loss has occurred. And you can also track how soon neighborhoods are getting their power back in a very, a very easy, uh, well, not easy, but uh, intuitive sense, very, very rapid data collection. Um, other things that we have been involved in from the ISS uh, are looking at a lot of cons conservation sites around the world, Ramsar sites. That's a very popular uh, science target for both astronauts and other researchers, where we can take imagery of sites, uh, bird, migrat uh, bird migratory habitats, things like Lake Baikal in the Soviet Union. Or, sorry, <laughs> I'm dating myself, uh, Russia. Um, uh, uh, but, so, and we can track those changes. We can see how, say, uh, water levels have risen or fallen. We can see how things have become reforested or not. We can see whether land has changed over from former agricultural uses back into uh, fallow fields that are being revegetated re with, with perhaps if not the original vegetation, new invasive species. Uh, these are all things that we can see now with remotely sensed data that we couldn't really look at, say, prior to 1970 in any real, uh, real regular sense. Yeah, uh, so I had a thought before this picture came up of when Will was talking about how our global, like weather and geologic systems are all connected. I was looking at like a time-lapse video the astronauts take. They take a lot of time-lapse imagery from space station and I could see this big dust plume coming off of the Sahara going over the Atlantic. And so I got curious um, just to be able to see dust from a photo from space. I was like, that's a lot of dust. <laughs> so I, I went into um, 
uh, this web a website through NASA called Worldview, and you can look at satellite data from a certain date, uh, whatever you pick. And I could go through the days and see this dust plume coming across. And it was from this year. And then I remembered, like, oh, well, we all live here in Houston. Over the summer, we had, they called it the Saharan dust, making our sky all hazy. And that just made that, like, little um, real connection to see imagery from above and then know that, yeah, the sky was kind of pink for a couple days here. And it, was a, it was an interesting effect. Well, um, I have one more question before we, we open it up to you guys. Um, but coming back around to the human perspective, the human eye, astronaut photography produces some of the most striking images that we see from Earth, uh, of Earth today. And when I look at these images, I think what matters to me the most is that I'm looking through the eyes of another person who has actually seen this wondrous scene. And so these images convey an experience um, like the Earthrise. And we get to reflect on what it means to be living on a planet um, through this experience of wonder. So in my research as an artist, I'm interested in this emotion of wonder um, because wonder reframes our sense of self and world and allows us to accept a new larger reality um, and that inspires us to feel small in, this, in the face of vastness. And we hear that from the astronauts. Um, we hear them talk about this. And because when we come into contact with that, small self, um, with that small self frame of reference, we actually diminish emphasis on the individual self in favor of a more altruistic perspective. So we literally become more compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented. So this sense of wonder actually connects us to our world and to each other. So in thinking about the Earthrise photograph that has captured a sense of wonder for 50 years, what do you imagine might be the next Earthrise? My wonder for the next Earthrise um, is related to what you said earlier, er Erica, about um, us constantly wanting to look back at ourselves um, at the Earth. And so I think kind of the next awe-inspiring or powerful image would be another like full disc shot of the Earth, but also further out where you also see like the full moon, um, possibly on the way to Mars. Or um, whether, whether the Earth is in the foreground or the background, um, seeing both planetary bodies um, in their entirety in one shot would be, um, I think, pretty profound to, to see. Uh, I, I, I have two that I could, I could proffer. Um, one, one I think is probably, probably fairly, a fairly obvious one, and that's uh, seeing the Earth from the surface of Mars uh, taken by an astronaut with a camera. Um, but the other, I think, is uh, when we, when we are able to see the first actual image of uh, one of the exoplanets that we've seen circling other stars. Uh, I think that would be a, a similar sort of Earthrise type image. Uh, it may not be of the Earth itself, but it's, it would be another sort of perspective setting shot, uh, a perspective setting image, because then we could actually see, you know, these aren't just calculated transits of light and dark across uh, a solar a sun's surface this is an actual other planet that from our perspective could be just as inhabited or uninhabited as ours appeared to be from the perspective of the apollo 8 astronauts so i would love to see those photographs too um, and at the same time I struggle with the notion that we need another Earthrise moment or another Earthrise photograph because we had one and it continues to be a profound image. And as you, I think, already know from what I said earlier, I don't think we fully understand or took responsibility for what that image is. And so I'm tentative to say, well, let's have another Earth image because that might help us understand ourselves even more 
but we haven't even understood what it offered back then. So I'm kind of caught in the middle because um, I would love to see those images and I think they would be powerful and beautiful and I think that we can never get enough wonder. You know, there's we need wonder um, and it does have that ability to, to shrink ourselves, to actually see ourselves in a place where we're not the dominant voice in the choir. Uh, but can we potentially just begin to learn to appreciate those moments of wonder and the moments of, uh, like the Earthrise photograph, and invest our energy there rather than always wanting to go further and further and further and create something new and create something new? I mean, how many moments of wonder scroll through your Instagram feed on a daily basis if you're just following National Geographic or NASA? You know, how many moments of wonder? Can you even take in that moments of wonder? Have you... Can you absorb all that wonder? We want to get more images that are wonderful. And we just begin to appreciate what we have. And, you know, just that that's what I, after making this film and going through an experience where I was immersed in the story of those people who had that moment of wonder, that first moment of awe of capturing the earth, of going through all those hours of archive footage and all those photographs, all filled with wonder and awe. It was like, that was so much for me to take in you know, to really understand that. And I would really encourage us to try to not go forward without understanding where we've come from. We continue to do that. We want to go forward without understanding where we've come from. And, you know, this this has a potential potentially to, to say, hey, this is who we are. This is where we are. Let's understand that before we take another photo. <laughs> well, let's give her a big round of applause. And I'd love to toss that question out to you all, and we'd love to hear from you too. So I think somebody's going to help us with mics. Let's start right here. Thank you. Uh, great discussion, hey Will. Um, some or all of you might be familiar with uh, a book that came out about 20 years ago, first edition, second edition, not too long ago. It's called The Overview Effect by Frank White. And ideally, it captures everything that's being discussed here, not so much the very scientific type um, uh, data, but more what he, he had the opportunity to interview, I think, about 90 astronauts and cosmonauts about who actually got the opportunity to look back and see the Earth and what the effect was for them. What did they feel? What was the political, the social, the psychological, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual type impact that, that uh, they had? And uh, I think it really speaks to a lot of what you're talking about and it was started by the Apollo 8 crew, but it's a fascinating, gripping read. Uh, if anybody's interested in learning more about not just looking at these images themselves, like you, do, you went through hundreds of them or thousands, but what these folks really had to say, you know, past the Apollo 8 crew, I think it's just amazing some of their responses. So just a recommendation. The Overview Effect by Frank White. And he's, there's also a website now dedicated to that. Thanks, Andy. I was 20 years old when this picture was taken. I remember those times very well. There was indeed in those days the rise of an earth consciousness. At the same time, we were living under the threat of total and quick annihilation by nuclear war. The last image of your movie is wonderful. It is a picture of the earth maybe taken from the space station, lower orbit. It's an optimistic message. Now I wonder what are you going to do next? What kind of stories am I going to tell next? Uh, I, I, I'm working right now on a, a film about uh, language keepers. Um, in California, where I live, uh, there are many, many different native languages that are on the verge of extinction. There are 35 different distinct language groups in, uh, in California alone. They say in Europe there are only three, right? And so and many of those have one or two or three speakers left. So I'm documenting the work of those of six different families who are trying to revitalize their languages. And so there are some that have like 10 or 15 speakers and some that just have one. 
so that's what I'm working on now. Uh, but um, you know, to speak to you, the question of like optimism and you know annihilation, so to speak, um, I think that I'm always drawn to try and tell stories that have a bit of both, um, because I think that's the time we live in. Uh, there's a lot of both. There's not one. And I, I think if I, I personally, as a filmmaker who spent a lot of time making environmental films, um, I, I think it's dangerous just to tell stories about destruction and decimation and uh, the fact that there's really nothing we can do, because that may be true, that, that, that it's that severe. But I do think that we need to find a way to see how we can be part of shifting that story. Um, not in a way that is false optimism, uh, false hope, but real hope. Because like these language keepers, you know, uh, such a different story, right, the, the, than, than the one here. But imagine if you're the last speaker of your language. No one to talk to who can understand your language. <laughs> you're French? Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, seriously, like you sit down with like someone who's the last person to speak their language, and they have no one to talk to in their language. Native American languages, yeah, there's many different. In California, just in my home state, there are many, many languages at risk. And I can't think of anything more scary to be like the last speaker of one's language, no one to communicate to. But you know, when I sit down with these people, they have tremendous optimism about what's possible if they just speak their language, teach their children, teach their family, teach people how to speak their language, because then the language can continue. So, and, and who knows if it will, right? The odds are against them, but the odds have been against those people for a very, very long time. And, you know, they have people in my, my state. So I use that as a parallel. Like, if that can have hold the annihilation and the decimation and the destruction in one hand and the possibility they can do it, then I think the rest of us can when we're looking at these larger quandaries. And yeah, you can pick up the front page of the New York Times today, and it says, emissions runaway freight train, no hope, essentially. And yeah, that's true. But, you know, we can shift things if the shift is at its root, a shift of perspective and a shift of consciousness, not a shift of an external action that can immediately be forgotten. That action needs to be related to a deep shift in consciousness and perspective. Otherwise, it's going to be fleeting. And so I try and tell stories that elicit that in some way. You, you use the word wonder a lot in the last 10 minutes. And I like it because for me, it, it, there was a time when I was able to experience that wonder. And that was in the 80s and 90s when my family, my friends, we went to theaters and saw Hail Columbia, Dream is Alive, Blue Planet, amazing films that were created and showcased what was going on on our planet. And when you left those theaters, people were talking about the images and how we have to be shepherds of our planet. And I think the challenge that, you, that we're facing is with the hundreds of thousands of photographs that are taken and in NASA's archives, finding the right way to convey that story to the public again is a challenge, and I don't know that we're doing that. Um, I, 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 I'm so sad that we haven't seen an IMAX film for for a long for too long, because for me, like I said, it it moved me in ways I can't even describe anymore. And and in most of the people that I saw them with, I mean, if you ever looked around at an IMAX film, and you, and you turned around and you looked at people. Their mouths were open. They were just, it was the wonder that you talked about that they experienced. And I, for one, miss it.
As the film pointed out in 1968, NASA wasn't that interested in having a picture of Earth, and even Frank Borman wasn't that interested in it. Uh, with the Apollo 17 picture that was shown there, if I remember correctly, was again not planned, but an on-the-spot decision, hey, that would make a nice picture. 22 years after Earthrise, NASA was reluctant to turn the Voyager 1 camera around to take that picture of the pale blue dot. I don't know if the picture of Earth through Saturn's rings was planned or just, hey, here's a picture through the rings, look what's there. Is NASA, NASA today is taking a lot of pictures close up, like you were showing with the glaciers, uh, for the Earth science and what it can help with. But do you think that in the future, NASA would be interested in, again, the more the overview pictures like Earthrise shows and the Apollo 17 one shows? Yeah. Yes, and, and in fact, uh, a lot of that, that imagery is, is still taken uh, on a daily basis um, by, not by NASA particularly, but uh, by NOAA, uh, the NOAA satellites, the GOES satellites, take that kind of disk imagery uh, quite often uh, for weather weather forecasting purposes. Um, so I'd say, uh, if, if I understand where where your question is coming from, we we, we do we, we do that operationally. You know, we do that for very specific uh, scientific and, and weather forecasting purposes. We don't really so much do it for artistic or aesthetic or philosophical purposes. I think in in the way that that the Earthrise and the Apollo seventeen, you know, all, all of this kind of imagery from the moon's orbit looking back at the earth uh, was taken for you know more of a, an individual choice by the astronaut to say oh that's a fantastic image I have to I have to record that um, we've we've kind of operationalized it to a, to a big degree um, and, and I, I unfortunately I can't I can't answer your question as to whether any of the the other like the Cassini project specifically wanted to take that image or if it was sort of serendipitous in other imagery that they were taking. Um, but I think I think it's important, even if they're not specifically designed for that kind of image. I think it's very important to recognize them when they when they are seen and to publicize them so that people can get that sense of wonder that we're talking about. Some of the what I've read historically talked about just that there was this sort of tense tug of war between the engineering side of operations for a mission and the you know the director of photography and the and um, you know the the social groups who were who were really wanting these these um, images of the moon uh, excuse me of, of the earth and so I think there has been this kind of a disconnect in a way um, consecutively and certainly you have um, came across that we talked about that in an early conversation yeah. um. The director of, I think, I don't know what his official title was, his name was Richard Underwood, and he, he ran the photography department at NASA. He was a propo you know, early, uh, was pushing for a photograph of the Earth from space. Um, but, you know, when I talked to the astronauts about it, they were like, yeah, I remember talking to Dick about stuff, but I don't remember talking about that. Um, so the culture at NASA at the time was that even if you had somebody who ran the, you know, the <laughs> photography department, was not getting his point across because the point was okay. We got to make this spaceship work. We got to get to the moon. We're not going to die. We got to beat the Russians. We got to get back here. We got to go back there. We got to plant a flag. Let's do that. Let's focus, focus, focus. And so they were they were just not, you know, interested whether they whether he was even able to convey it to them. You know, they were just they didn't take it in. Maybe he did. I I, I pressed them about that. So the culture then was so different, and uh, I, I do think it has come. You know. A long way. I just had a conversation with someone NASA who was, you know, basically creating a virtual reality film of what it's like to be on the International Space Station right now, so you can have that virtual experience that the astronauts have. So potentially you can get as close to that overview effect that you were talking about. So I think the culture has changed because I don't think that conversation would have been happening, you know, ten years ago, twenty years ago. So yeah, you have. Let's take one more here. Um, for the filmmaker, what will be, you said you, you, you wanted to do this to reconnect, to connect again. What will be the message you would like for the new generations that are watching this 
what would you like to be, because they will take on right, whatever we do now. I think we need to fall back in love with the earth again. And I think we need to teach young people how to fall in love with the earth again. And I think that those of us, you know, in the audience, I wasn't there myself in 1968, there was that moment of falling in love with the earth. You know, that was what was captured in that beautiful poem by Arthur McLeish. It was like falling back in love with the earth and finding a way to express that. And as Frank Borman said, we quickly got back to business. We forgot about love. We, f we remembered capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and forward motion and next thing and, and business as usual. That's what he described it as. So I think we need to go back to what it means to be in love with something. I know that sounds, it sounds a little cliche, a little cheesy potentially, but, you know, I view this film and why I made this and what I felt in myself when I was making it was this was a love letter to the earth. That's what I told myself every day when I went to the edit. I was making a love letter to the earth. I love the earth. I don't like, want to make a film about people falling in love with the earth and a photograph that captured what it meant to be in love with the earth and remind people of the power of what it means to be in love with the earth. It's really simple, a love letter. And so if younger people could have that sentiment and have that core, like a real relationship, if it's not founded on love, it dissipates, right? Like whether you're with a you know, family member or a friendship, if it's really rooted in love, it stays there, even if you don't see that person for a long time. And so why can't we have that relational uh, feeling with, with our whole planet or with things outside of the a human-centric worldview? So can the film do that? And can, then I would be in some small way, if it's just a few people, I'd be really happy.